Hello, welcome to Worship at Medicine Street United Methodist Church. I am Harriet Bryan, and we are thrilled that you are with us today, whether you are worshiping with us in person or you have joined us online. I have a question for you this morning. How much do you expect God to be at work in your life to shape you and mold you into the person that God created you to be and wants you to be? This morning's service is going to explore that and several other questions, so keep that in mind, if you will. But now, friends, in spite of the fact that everyone within the sound of my voice is not happy, I'm going to invite you to smile at somebody near you, to take a deep breath, knowing that you are in the presence of God and of God's people. And I invite you, if you are in the sanctuary with us, if you would stand and join in the call to worship. We come with praise for the wonderful works of God. Even before we speak, God knows us completely. The Holy One knows us and sustains us, even in our moments of confusion and doubt. Who can count the thoughts of God? They are more than all the sands of the desert. Like, like clay in the hand of the potter, we are shaped into vessels of divine will. We come with praise for the wonderful works of God.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Boundless shaper of people and nations, you are closer than our knowing, yet closer to us than every breath. You are before us and behind us, surrounding us with your love and fashioning all of creation in the secret depths of your heart. With every thought, with every song, and with every prayer, turn these fragile earthen vessels of our lives into the spirit-filled body of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, grade five and under, we invite you to come up to such a special time just for you in our worship. Grades five and under. If you are worshiping online, good morning. We have such a big air hug for you and we're so glad that you're here. Christine, and as you can tell, I'm not Miss Brooke, but she left us something very exciting in this bag. But she told me that I wasn't allowed to look until I got up here with you guys. So can you help me figure out these clues and figure out what it is? Are you ready? Okay, here's your first clue. You can squish it. Your second one, it's very, very soft. And your third thing is you can make it into whatever you want. And I'm going to give you one more. You probably all have played with it before. What do you think? I think it's a, a type of ball fidget. Ooh, a ball fidget? Those sound fun. What do you think? Play-Doh. Ooh, Play-Doh. What do you think? You think it's what? Sad? Okay. Let me show you because someone already guessed it. It's Play-Doh. So we can take this Play-Doh out of the container. You can squish it. It's pretty soft. You can make it into a snake. I can flatten it. But there's something really important that I have to remember to do when I'm done. Does anyone know what that might be? What do we have to do? Oh, yeah, clean it up because our parents don't like sticky Play-Doh everywhere, do they? So how do we clean it up? We keep it or vacuum it. Or okay, we can vacuum it up if we make a really big mess. Hopefully not on our carpet, right? What do you think? <gasps> yeah, we have to take it and put it back in the container all the way in. And then what do we always have to remember to do? Put the lid on and make sure it's closed. Have you ever forgotten to do that with your Play-Doh? Yeah? What happens to it when we forget? What? It slides up into the stick you have it, and then you have, and then it's gone forever. It's gone forever. It gets hard. It gets brittle. And we can't ever play with it again, and we have to throw it away. Right? And that makes us kind of sad. Right? And then, even worse, if it gets stuck in our carpet and gets hard... Our parents get really mad, don't they? Never. Yeah. So I want you to think about Play-Doh as you. Okay? If I can get it back out. There we go. And I want you to think about this container as God. When you're out in the world, you can be molded and shaped by everything around you. And sometimes those things aren't very good, are they? And sometimes they are really good. And I want you to think about this container as God. And I want you to think about yourself being shaped, molded, and protected by God, just like this Play-Doh is in this container. And he is shaping us every single day. He is protecting you every single day. So whenever you go to school this week, I want you to think about 
you as the Play-Doh and God as the container and know that he is shaping and protecting you every day. Yes. At school, we were learning about adaptation and we're about to make an animal into whatever we need. And so I made this into how every adaptation is going to shape your adaptation. Wow. You're an artist, I can tell. Can we say a blessing together? Yes. Let's all bow our heads. May we always be shaped by God. Amen. Thank you. be seated. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes to us from the 18th chapter of the prophet Jeremiah, beginning with the first verse. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Says the Lord, just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning with which I have spoken turns back from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, 
I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. And here also the gospel reading that comes to us from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I invite you to stand as a reminder that the risen Christ is in our midst. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance." Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repeats, who repents not repeats, repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May be seated. Friends, I always consider it a huge joy and an honor to be able to preach in this beautiful sanctuary. This may be one of the first times, though, that I have really wished that we either had a large platform that I had a potter sitting at working a wheel, or that we had screens so that you could watch a potter at work. Instead, I'm going to invite you to use your imaginations. If you've ever seen a potter at work, then you'll be able to join right in, and if not, we're going to see how well I do describing this process so that you can visualize it. I feel just a little bit of pressure, but we're going to see how this goes. If you have ever watched a potter at work, you know that the potter begins by taking a formless lump of clay and slapping it down on the wheel. And it has to be done just so. It has to be centered because if the clay isn't exactly centered on that wheel, then the whole process won't work and the vessel will fall apart. And then once that clay is centered, the potter starts the wheel turning. And the potter wraps their hands around the wet clay and bends over it, holding the clay firmly, strongly, but almost tenderly. Everything that the potter does is done with care and with intentionality with skill and patience until this shapeless lump of clay begins to take shape slowly but surely because the potter has a vision for what this clay is going to become. And the clay changes and grows under the skillful hands of the potter. The potter brings the clay up, moves the clay out, adds water when the clay starts to get dry, and focuses intently on this lump of clay until it becomes whatever it is, perhaps a pitcher, perhaps a plate, that the potter had envisioned when the potter began work. I have a friend who described this process for me who wanted to learn how to make pottery. And she said, I was so excited when I first went into the pottery studio. But it was a slow process, Harriet. 
The gifted potter showed me over and over again how to hold my hands, how to fix errors, how to pull the clay up or push the clay down. I discovered how incredibly difficult the whole process was. The pros had made it look so easy. I fought back feelings of inadequacy and frustration. That darn clay didn't seem to want to do a thing that I wanted it to do. If I wanted to go one way, it would do its own thing and go the other way. I'd pull it up, it'd fall down. I'd try to thicken the walls and inevitably they would get too thin. I would try to make the rim even and symmetrical, but it seemed to have a mind of its own. I tried unsuccessfully to control it and as a result, experienced numerous failed attempts. My lumps of clay were not becoming works of art. I was a long way from being a master potter, but then my teacher returned. She put her hands around mine and guided them. She knew when to be strong and firm, and she knew when to back off and to be gentle and let the clay speak its own word. With her guidance, a beautiful bowl took shape right in front of me. I was amazed and humbled. Today's scripture passage from Jeremiah invites us to see God as a potter, as one who wants to take us and shape us into the being that God has envisioned that we can be. And God doesn't just want to take us as individuals, but God wants to take us as a body, as the church. Some of you know that next week, Following worship, we're going to have an informational session about what in the world's going on with the Greater United Methodist Church right now. And my shorthand is um, outside of Madison Street, United Methodist Church, of course. Um, the church as a whole is sort of a hot mess right now. And yes, I said it and it's been recorded. There you go. Um, but the reason that I have hope for myself, for us, for the United Methodist Church, and for all churches is because I know that when we allow the potter to work with us and to shape us, God can and will do something beautiful in and through us. So God speaks to the entire people of Israel in chapter 18 and not just to the prophet Jeremiah. Just wanted to throw that in as I now go back to focusing on this potter at work. The word translated potter in Jeremiah is based on the more general verb yatsar, to fashion and form. It's the same verb that is used in the second chapter of Genesis when it says that God takes the dust of the earth and fashions humans. Thus, the image is of God as potter who creates us and who shapes us. And this morning's sermon is going to be a series of questions. So I invite you to listen or you will miss one. The first question I want to ask is, are we rigid and fixed or are we open to the potter's hand? Are we open to God's activity? As we go down to the potter's house, we may learn the difference between clay that has been fired and clay that has not yet been fired. Clay that has been fired has a specific use and a shape. You're not going to be able to make it into something else. This is a pitcher. You are not going to use this to eat lunch, unless perhaps you have soup, and then it might still be a messy affair. It started out as a lump of clay that has been fired. This is a plate. I am not going to attempt, even though the plants in my office are looking sort of sad because I forgot to water them this week, I am not going to attempt to go down and to fill this with water and water my plants. Um, it would make a mess. Clay like that is dry, brittle, and the only way to change the shape is to break it. But once you break it, it won't be able to fulfill the purpose. 
but clay that has not yet been fired is pliable. It may be shaped and reshaped infinitely. It is a material of possibility. It is moldable, flexible, and responsive. Although God has shaped us and breathed life into us, God has not fired the clay from which God made us. No one of us is a pitcher or a plate or a tile or a lamp. God is able to shape us and to reshape us when we submit to the potter's hands. God assesses our character, perceives our strengths and our weaknesses, builds on our strengths, and when flaws are found, will diligently work to remove them. And so the second question I ask is whether or not we have surrendered our lives to God, whether we've allowed God to center us on that wheel so that God is at the center of our lives and the potter can work with us. The hymn that we sang just before the scripture was read is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And I don't know how many of you know the story behind that hymn, but the author of those words, Adelaide Pollard, was born in Iowa and moved to Chicago, where she became a teacher in a girls' school. She developed a fine reputation in addition to teaching at the school as a traveling Bible study teacher. And later, she worked with two different evangelists, one who had a healing ministry and the other who focused on the imminent return of Christ. Now, Pollard's heart's desire was to be a missionary in Africa. She believed that that's what God had called her to be. And she was deeply disappointed when the doors did not open for her. She taught at a missionary training school in New York, but still had the dream of being a missionary in Africa. She made it to Africa, but it was just before World War I broke out, and she had to leave and go to Scotland where it was safe. After that, she still had this dream in her heart. She tried to collect funds that would enable her to go serve as a missionary in Africa, and she simply could not raise the money. She was sitting in a prayer meeting when this passage from Jeremiah 18 was read. And she went home and wrote the words that we sang. Have thine own way, Lord. You are the potter, I am the clay. She came to a place of surrender where she was willing and able to trust that God was yet going to do something with her. Not what she had envisioned, but she trusted that God had a different vision for her life makes me think of John Wesley, founder of Methodism's covenant prayer that we often pray at the beginning of a new year. You may remember hearing some of these words if you have been a United Methodist for a while. Put me to what you will, place me with whom you will, put me to doing, put me to suffering, let me be put to work for you or set aside for you, praised for you or criticized for you, let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and your service. That's a big prayer, friends. So the first question was, have I surrendered? And the second question is, am I intentionally partnering with God so that God can shape me and remove that, those things in my life that are deficiencies that keep me from being used in the way that God would have me be used? I think it's key to note here, and I hope you heard that while I was describing the work of the potter, that God is at work, but the master potter allows shapes and molds the clay, but also pulls back and lets the clay, to an extent, do its own thing. It's a complex partnership that occurs. God chooses not to make us do anything. 
God does not make us use our gifts or make us bless others, even though God created us to do good works. In the words of Old Testament scholar Anathea Portier-Young, we are neither automatons nor closed circuits. The shape of our character and our lives is not fixed. We as individuals and as communities may be formed through education and the practice of virtue. We may be deformed through abuse and ambition. We are susceptible to influence, suggestion, temptation, and corruption. We are also resilient and capable of astonishing goodness and true conversion. Through it all, even in the company of others and even in relationship with God, each of us forms our own intentions and exercises our own free will. At the conclusion of this passage in Jeremiah, God asks Jeremiah, not commands, God even says please to speak to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to summon them to conversion. God has planned an end for the kingdom of Judah, but this future is not fixed. Just as the potter returns to the wheel and remolds the clay that is pliable, so God asks the people to return, please, each one from the evil path that they have chosen to make their words and their deeds good. And God asks the same of us. So what does partnering with God look like? I mean, I can throw around the word sanctification. That's a good Wesleyan word is how the Holy Spirit works in us to shape us. And that doesn't necessarily do a lot of good if I, didn't, if I don't give you anything to go with that. So this means taking advantage of the spiritual disciplines, being in community, reading our Bibles, praying, trying to be intentional about listening for a word from God. I don't know if you're on Facebook. I don't know if you know that we have a new adult discipleship Facebook page, but Jared posted some of John Wesley's historical questions. I actually, he posted all of them. I'm going to share some of them with us this morning. And these are the sorts of questions that we can ask when we are trying to figure out how open we are to the potter shaping us. Am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I am better than I am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Am I honest in all my acts and words, or do I exaggerate? Do I confidentially pass on what was told to me in confidence? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? Did the Bible live in me today? Do I give it time to speak to me every day? Do I pray about the money I spend? Do I disobey God in anything? Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distressful? How do I spend my spare time? Is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold resentment toward, or disregard? If so, what am I going to do about it? Do I grumble and complain constantly? Is Christ real to me? And then the questions, a couple of the questions that Wesley invited folks in small groups to ask, what known sins have you committed since our last meeting? And have you nothing that you desire to keep secret? Now, I don't know about you, friends, but I'm really thinking I shouldn't have worn open shoes this morning because I've been stomping on my own feet pretty hard with these questions that have come to us from centuries ago. And so now I'm going to ask the final questions that are a part of today's sermon. Do I write myself and others off as lost causes, or do I accept and extend God's grace? Do I write myself and others off, or do I accept God's grace? The potter had a choice when the potter was working. The potter could have taken that lump of clay and thrown it away and reached down and taken another lump of clay and said, I'm going to work with this one instead. 
But that's not what we heard in this passage from Jeremiah. Instead, we heard that the potter continued to work in partnership with the clay. The scripture says specifically in verse 4 that the potter remade it into another vessel. Now, someone listening to this may be thinking, my life is simply too messed up, too marred for God to be able to do anything with me, anything of great significance anyway. And friends, I'm here to tell you that is simply not true. In fact, I'm going to go a step farther and say not only is it not true, it's a lie. God looks at us and says, you know, this clay is marred. But what I do best is take clay that is not what I created it to be and shape it into that which I created it to be. It's this whole process of all these things that we have suffered and lost and messed up, how they become a part of our ongoing witness and our ongoing testimony when we allow God into our lives. Pastor James Merritt said, and I wish I'd found this quote before the bulletin was printed, but I didn't, so here you go. No clay is so marred that the hands of God cannot detect it, affect it, correct it, and direct it to become something absolutely beautiful. With God, there's always hope just around the corner. It doesn't matter how dark our lives have become. It doesn't matter how messed up we think that we are. It is never too late to begin again. It is never too late to start over. God can take us, transform us, and use us. You may be thinking, that sounds good, but I just don't believe it. Friends, it is true, and the invitation is for us not to put a period or close the book where God has put a comma or a semicolon and wants to write more chapters in our lives. There's a story that's told of the great inventor Thomas Edison. When he was 67 years old, and he created all sorts of things, when he was 67 years old, his workshop caught fire and burned up. His 24-year-old son was with him, and they tried to put the fire out together, and they couldn't. And his son later said, Dad's hair was sticking out everywhere. His face was streaked with ash, and I had no idea what he was going to say to me. I just knew that he was going to be devastated because his life and his work were going up in flames and there was absolutely nothing that we could do. But instead, Edison looked at his son and said, go get your mom quick. She's never seen a fire like this. And so he did. And then after the fire had burned down the next day, Edison was out there kicking the embers around, and he said, Son, you know, there is something wonderful about a fire like this. And the son looked at him and said, Dad, what in the world would be wonderful about a fire like this? And he said, Son, it seems like it just sort of burns up your mistakes and your failures and lets you have a fresh start. Three months later, Edison's company presented the world with its first phonograph because this was a man who did not see his problems as the end, but simply a new start and a new beginning. And so I tell you again, with God, there is always the possibility of a new start and a fresh beginning if we will surrender our lives to God and allow God to work in and through us if we will partner with God. I dare say some of us have not fully surrendered our lives to God. We're holding something back. Others of us may not have taken the step, even though we come to church on a regular basis, 
or participate in worship online, however it may be. But some of us may not have taken that step of saying, Jesus, I need you. Please come into my heart and into my life and transform me and make me into who you created me to be. Help me claim the forgiveness that you offer. Help me trust that my life is not over, that you have a purpose and you will yet do something in and through me. Perhaps you said yes to Jesus a long time ago, but somewhere along the way you slipped and you have strayed off the path and you're not really sure that God wants to welcome you, that God is out searching for you like that shepherd searched for the lost sheep or the woman who searched for the lost coin. But the fact is that God is always searching for us, is always inviting us, is always welcoming us, that God manages the potter's wheel, that God has an endless supply of water to add when we start becoming too dry and too brittle. And that's true for us individually, and that's true for us corporately. And that is why I dare speak to you week after week, because I believe that God is faithful and that God will do more in and through us than we dare dream or imagine, as it says in Ephesians, if we will but surrender and allow God to work through us. May we trust God today and every day. Amen. I invite you to stand as together we affirm the words of our faith using the words here in the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I want to remind you that you, if you have a prayer request, you can always contact either Pastor Harriet or myself, either by email or by our phones. But you can also send your prayer request to our, our email at prayer at madisonstreetumc.org. This morning, we particularly want to extend our Christian sympathy to the families of Carol Dunlop, Blake Williams, Amber Brockett, and Kenny York. I would ask during these coming days if you will keep these family in your prayers. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you mark the journey of life with change. Once again, we witness your creation moving from one season to the other. We give you praise for the wonders of this summer that now draw to a close. We praise you for cool mornings and crisp days and leaves beginning to change colors. As we move towards the turning of the season, 
we give you thanks that with every change you are with us. In our lives we have both joy and sorrow. In this month of September, we have celebrated the joys of grandparents and grandchildren, and we have mourned the losses in our nation on the anniversary of 9-11. We ask that you continue to give us strength to endure our collective sorrow as we remember the events on that September morning 21 years ago. Loving Lord, help us move forward as a nation working towards your vision for our world. This morning, we ask comfort for those that mourn the passing of loved ones. For each remembered smile, for each act of kindness that changed the world for the better, and for each life that was touched, we lift up and give you thanks for the life that was once present, but is now in your eternal rest. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we ask prayers for all those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit, for those who are waiting for answers from their doctors, for those who are waiting for a scheduled surgery, and for all those who are weary from enduring pain, we ask your healing. Lord, in your mercy. Nurturing God, we ask your prayers for school children of every age, for the preschool toddler who cries and misses her mom, to the college senior who is discerning career and future. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have called many of your people to be teachers. For all those who have answered the call to a life of teaching, Please give extra shares of kindness and patience, wisdom and courage to face the challenges of teaching students in this day and age. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, for all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, we ask that you hear the pleadings of our heart this morning as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou art the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I always give thanks for you and for your generosity. Your generosity makes a whole host of things happen that you may and may not think about. We have a professionally staffed nursery on Sunday mornings, which is a draw for parents of young children. Your generosity helps make our live streaming possible and provides the salary for the wonderful man who's back there running all of this, or men, because we've got sound too. There are two of them back there. Takes two. Your generosity helps feed people who are hungry in our community. And as we unite with United Methodists around the world, we have already collected over $27 million in aid that has been sent to Ukraine. So I simply lift this up as a reminder when we join our resources together, God can and does work through us. And I invite you now to take advantage of one of the ways to give if you have not already done so and you are able. I still remember when I heard you call me by name. follow you anywhere, knew I could trust you in anything, but now sorrow beats down on me, waiting for you to come through. I'm all alone with my questions, I'm dry and cracked open, I thirst for you, and as I fall Help me. 
hands tell the story of love that will never let go of me. Through the sunshine or rain, I know where my hope is found. What you started in I invite you to stand as together we give thanks. Faithful one, you have entrusted us with so many gifts that are more important than worldly possessions. You have called us to be stewards of all you, that you have created. We strive to fulfill your call to be generous stewards by openly sharing the bounty you have placed under our care. We know that we visibly demonstrate our commitment to your work in this world by giving these tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, if you want to know more about what it's like to surrender your life to Christ, it really is saying, I surrender, forgive me, I want to follow you, please be at work in my life. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time or the tenth time, I would ask that you would let a pastor know or somebody else know so that we can pray with or for you. Um, Because as sure as you take that step, there's going to be the temptation to not follow through, to take the clay of your life back. That's just the reality in which we live. So please hear that invitation clearly this morning. If you're a first-time guest of ours and you're in person, I ask that you would stop at the Guest Connections table on your way out. We have a small gift for you, and we want to make sure that we've connected with you. If you're worshiping with us online, please text the number on the screen, which is 740-1882. Again, we want to be able to follow up and to connect with you. I hope that you know that we have a picnic this afternoon at Dixon Park at the Elm Inn train station and that you are going to join us at four o'clock or thereabouts and that you're going to bring a chair, a side dish, and either a serving spoon or utensil that you don't care about or one that you've put your name on because we're not going to guarantee that you get it back. Um, We have said that we'd have a shuttle service. Maybe more of you are going to come and we hope you do. Um, We will have enough food. That's the way these things work. We know this. Um, But we did ask you to register in advance. But if you didn't, that's okay. Still show up. But we are not going to have a dedicated shuttle service the entire time. There's going to be a sign that says, call or text if you need a shuttle service. If you cannot find parking there and um, at the park and you want to come here. So just wanted to give you that heads up. Um, And again, I would remind you that next Sunday following worship, there's an informational session for anybody who wants to come about the Greater United Methodist Church. Now, if you are really on top of things, you may have already figured out that our closing hymn is 438 and not 428. Um, If you haven't, I invite you to turn to 438.
Friends, hold on to this good news. No matter how long any of us may live, we will not be able to grasp in this lifetime just how much God loves us. And because God loves us so much, we can surrender our lives to God, trusting that God will forgive us, reshape us, mold us, and use us. Thanks be to God. Let us go forth in joy and in peace. Amen.